I will share my screen. Okay. Can you guys keep, see my screen? Can you confirm this in the chat or my voice? Okay, perfect. So, um, as you can see in the first uh, slide of my presentation, this is a uh, continuation of the previous lecture uh, about React, React.js, a library for our UI part of the web. Uh, this is an advanced um, lecture compared to the previous one. We'll dive deeper into the um, some underlining um, details of React.js library and uh, these these details are not just some uh, patterns or maybe like best practices that everyone needs to know. I think you'll have a chance to Google it yourself eventually. This is an advanced section of uh, React.js documentation. Um, you might have already seen this uh, documentation. I will briefly show it to you before I continue with the lecture. So uh, at the uh, react.js.org, you have a uh, documentation for React. It's one of the best written documentation for a library slash framework. And during the previous lecture, you covered some of the concepts from the main section. And uh, by the end of the today's lecture, we are aiming to fully cover all the main concepts and touch onto some of the advanced topics uh, in the advanced uh, guide section. Um, with this uh, in mind, so you can basically um, see that the uh, JavaScript uh, and some mecha JavaScript mechanics uh, in the React library uh, by the end of today's lecture will be uh, familiar to you already and then um, during some of the next lectures you will move to uh, styling so the, the presentation uh, the UI part of the whole react uh, ecosystem and then to the some uh, to some of the state management and uh, routing libraries so uh, my name is Dimitri I am a software engineer at EPAM and I'm mostly a full stack developer, so I work not only just with the, the UI part, but the back end, including Node.js and AWS. Uh, that means I love JS, and I, um, I, I like to play with everything JS. Um, I've given lectures uh, regarding what I know uh, in React and Node.js. Uh, uh, in other mentoring programs internally excellent and i hope you like my today so as i mentioned already we will uh, start right uh, at the point that uh, the previous lecturer left you with the react basics uh, we'll recap the components uh, their basic structure and their like um, two types of components then we'll go into the state and props and in depth this time uh, I'll explain like why do we need them then go uh, prop types lifecycle hooks uh, the ones that you are requ you requested uh, from the previous lecture hooks which are uh, arguably uh, the um, the way of having the same functionality as lifecycle hooks but in functional components then go refs, uh, fragments, error boundaries, and uh, uh, a more advanced feature, not only with in the React ecosystem, high order components of functions. And we start with the functional and class components. Uh, during the previous lecture, you, you've learned that basically to render something on the screen using React.js library, you have uh, two ways of doing that. You can use either functional component, 
which represents, uh, as it stated in the name, with a function and uh, with a class component, which is basically a JavaScript class, but extended uh, from the basic React class component. Uh, okay. Data and props. Um, I remember that the previous lecture mentioned that the uh, one thing that is distinct between functional and class components, not only that uh, the form uh, in, in what you write, in which you write these components, but uh, uh, most importantly, the state. Um, functions uh, are just a piece of code that gets executed and returns something back, and everything inside of it gets collected with um, using some kind of garbage collection mechanism. So uh, that means if we're using functional components, uh, it just returns some JSX and is done with it. There's no, nothing left in the memory that we can use to either optimize the rendering or maybe keep some of the um, you know, like parameters in the memory so we can reuse them. There is no such thing. It just executes, renders, either uh, visually shows us something, and it's done. The only way to uh, change it somehow is to re-render. And uh, this uh, understanding of how functional components leads us to uh, class components, which are basically uh, objects uh, in the vanilla JavaScript that can contain some of properties and methods. And uh, a very known method in uh, components is, uh, in glass components is render. So basically, what's inside uh, a render component, uh, a, ran a render method, is basically the same thing that's inside a, a functional component that leaves us with the rest of the class that we can use to somehow store some data or maybe some methods outside of the render. And this is exactly what why uh, Facebook introduced class components. They wanted to have an access, a um, some kind of some kind of period of time, an access to some inter internal state. Uh, consequently, they named it state, and it's just an object, uh, and it's a part of a React component, uh, and it's a property. So on the left, we can see that they um, give this object the name state and put it into the um, this of the current class. Later, we learn that the, it's even possible to avoid constructor and just use a class property to define your state. Uh, state and props are two ways that we uh, can somehow change the behavior and reuse the component. So uh, this is one of the main features that React um, gives us is the ability to write some kind of boilerplate code, a component, uh, be it a functional component or a class component, and then uh, reserve some variables inside that component, inside the JSX of that component, so that we can later um, introduce a variety of uh, variables that can be uh, shown in place of those uh, templates. That means uh, state is almost the same thing as props, and uh, some of you might, mm, might be confused with uh, uh, this two distinct objects uh, in components uh, ecosystem. Uh, but they are quite different. Um, and uh, one of the main differences is the purpose that they used. So props are a way, f um, a way to communicate between components, between the parent component and the child component. And the state is just for child's only use. So a child uses its state to store some uh, data, and it gets some data from uh, its parent. So this small table shows us uh, 
like some some of the differences and use cases to, to distinguish state from props. Um, unidirectional, uh, unidirectional data flow is also one of the things that uh, that was mentioned in the previous lecture. It is a uh, basically a pattern or um, a paradigm that Facebook introduced with their React library. They just said uh, to simplify things so that we don't introduce two-way data binding, as they say. Um, in other words, we want to control how the data flow from start to finish without any interruptions, without any unexpected things that are happening in between. We don't want that. How can we make it happen? And they introduce unidirectional data flow, which means only the data that's inside parent and the data that gets passed by parent to its child is present in the child. You cannot pass some data from child to parent directly. And uh, uh, the whole state and unidirectional data flow leads us to one of the most important distinction uh, and uh, features that React brought to the table of uh, web development, uh, which is stateful or stateless component, or you can uh, name them uh, smart and dumb component, or container and component, or container and presentational components. Those are basically the same things, uh, slight deviations and differences in naming are just uh, semantics. Uh, stateful versus stateless components is a paradigm that one component holds all the logic, the data, um, the, the methods that change the data, basically state. It does not render anything. It doesn't have, uh, in, the, in its purest form, it doesn't have any um, visual feedback to the user. What it has is uh, imported, import, imported and rendered child components. And those child components are stateless components, meaning they are essentially dumb. They, they, they don't change the data. They don't hold the state inside of them. They're just there to render something. So you uh, divide and conquer. You use one of those solid principles where you have a single responsibility with is actually one of the things that React is built upon, which is state in the stateful component. It's its single responsibility is to hold the state and the logic and stateless. Single responsibility, render something to the user. Um, that, that leads us to um, a more concise definition of what stateful and stateless components are. So stateful components, once again, they know how everything works. Uh, they serve uh, as just a container for other components. They provide application data. They perform data fetching, data uh, analysis, changing, mapping, anything that concerns data. And then we have con stateless components, which are just there to display things that they receive via props from, from their parent. This is how it looks uh, when it comes to coding. So as you can see, stateless versus stateful components are not just in those uh, metaphysical definitions that nobody cares about, but actually in the code itself. Uh, at the bottom, you see the um, two components, to-do list and filters pane. Uh, by, by, even by their size, you can uh, basically say that these are quite limited in their uh, use. These components are quite dumb. And the one that's above to do container is actually a juicy one that holds all the logic. So when it comes to uh, a practical, like practical production oriented code, basically you will see that the stateful components are much larger. They hold all these different uh, names uh, like uh, lifecycle hooks, render methods, 
and stateless component are just functions or very very limited in functionality um, functions with hooks for example uh, and given this uh, strict definition of stateful and stateless components we gain some benefits uh, from this uh, paradigm the application becomes more understandable we have a very distinct uh, uh, like line between where you keep your logic and where you keep your states. It's almost like those uh, old uh, grumpy days where we had model view controller. So it's kind of the same thing, uh, but in the UI, you have a model with its uh, data, some controller methods that uh, do something with the data and you have a view and view is represented with a stateless component. Uh, that greatly reduces uh, complexity. Uh, the components become reusable if they're not uh, tied to some specific states, fetching or methods. Uh, they can be reused anywhere given that the data will be given to them. And that creates a very simple um, components. So, as I mentioned already, this whole thing in React uh, that is based on the stateful and stateless components relies on some way of communicating between stateless and stateful components, or between parent and child component. So, uh, you communicate between those components top down, meaning using props and state uh, down the component tree if you have a very large tree of components and you have a data at the very beginning of your application and you need that data somewhere down below uh, in the furthest child you need to use props and states to um, traverse the whole component tree to get the data from the uh, the root in the component tree to the most uh, uh, leaves of child children. To avoid this situation, there are some stateful management libraries that provide some additional functionality to avoid this kind of thing that React relies upon. So what I mentioned if I have a list of items and each of the items uh, need some functionality upon the data that they are given, uh, you can pass them that functionality. For example, we have, I don't know, suddenly we have a list of buttons that do almost the same thing, but anyway, uh, they do that thing on different data. So the same function, the same method, that those buttons do but with a different data so why won't we just give uh, the callback or the that handler handler to each of the item uh, and then we can just change the data and they will decide that the items itself themselves they will decide when to call or when to use that handler and we can keep the handler the actual definition of the handler in the list component and then when we uh, define it in the list component items they don't nothing <laughs> about how the on delete uh, function works but they anyway call it and they rely upon you passing uh, the callback uh, that's the only thing that you need to know they don't see the outside world they don't see the list so we keep all the, uh, the logic in the list and then we pass that logic or those handlers to items. It, and it's very, um, uh, very common way to do things in React. So um, again, given what I just said, we have even class components. You see, we're not using just the functional components. So this, these items are not really that dumb. But anyway, they are children of a list and list is apparent so we are using um, our item in the parent rendering a map 
uh, of items, each of the items receive the on the lit uh, handler, which is defined in the parent component and not defined in the item component. That means we somehow manage to use uh, the handler outside of the item component. We just rely on the parent component to pass the handler to us. And this is the core thing in React. So parent-child communication using props. But as I mentioned, what if uh, a child component, given it a function or, or a class component, it expects some kind of function to be passed in the on-delete handler, and it even calls the function, but we didn't pass it. Uh, how can we ensure that in the very big production application, we don't just uh, ignore uh, some of the components' requirements, ignore their logic, and do not pass the things that they expect. Well, in production, we don't. If it gets into production, we are actually doomed. But once we are developing, we can use some kind of a library that analyzes props, basically uh, gives us tools to define what uh, exactly each prop is and what is default behavior and it's kind of like a fail safe you define your props you expect some things with those props and you define the default behavior and you kind of save so uh, prop types is one of those libraries that save you a ton of time it won't help you in production mode again and some tools like TypeScript or even an older one, Flow, they might help you even better. They will forbid you to uh, do bad things with your code in React. Uh, but uh, not every not every project has uh, TypeScript or Flow. And prop types are the things that Facebook themselves uh, introduced in the React community. Uh, this is how it looks. So basically you are defining your component and then somewhere in the same file you define a name of the component, then dot prop types and give an object. So as you remember, props are just objects uh, that contain all the things that can be passed and used inside a component. And then following the same structure, you just... Uh, uh, pass all the data and define uh, using the prop types library what the data is actually um, about. So basically, define a type of each field. It can be quite useful. And uh, then what you get is that when you are actually expecting, um, for example, a hello component expects to have props and inside props it expects name to be a string and we just passed a number, we get the warning. So this is the only thing that prop types does. Uh, it creates warnings inside uh, the console. Uh, it's not really a big deal. Uh, again, in production you won't get any errors. It just uh, executes and nothing happens. But if you have a CI/CD pipeline, if you have a some kind of automatic deployment, automatic testing, you will get uh, no deployment basically if you don't pass prop types checks. It can be introduced in your project. Not every project does because prop types are very um, tedious to write. But anyway, so uh, I think we're half through the lecture maybe you have a like question or a few questions about the context okay I guess no questions so far this is good that means uh, the lecture is uh, is a really useful for you so lifecycle hooks um, uh, lifecycle methods uh, how you can call them too 
each component, uh, each class component, I should say, has some kind of uh, state. We already mentioned we need some kind of component that can hold state. If it holds state, we understand that by having some kind of uh, state, we introduce some kind of life to a component, meaning that at the very beginning, it doesn't have any state. It needs to initialize the state, then it needs to do something with the state, and then in the end, when we unmount the data, it basically does some wiping out of the data so that the garbage collector can then uh, wipe the whole thing clean again and we're done with the component. So functional components, they're just functions. Uh, their default behavior is to be cleaned by um, garbage collector. The class components are a special type of things that hold state. That means they have lifespan. And this is whole this whole thing about the lifespan of a component uh, is called lifecycle methods or hooks uh, in React community. And as I mentioned, we have a beginning, uh, the beginning, <laughs> I should say, which is a mounting state. Then uh, the the life itself, updating state. So as you mentioned, uh, <laughs> as you know, and uh, we already mentioned. Uh, components are um, rendered in the dome and then then they can be updated on the fly without uh, any uh, code that we need to write the react handles the updating and then when we delete the component it gets unmounted which is the unmounting stage and uh, the whole stages are things in the background um, you just need to know about them because Facebook guys, they provided some of the ways to peek into that, uh, uh, into those details so that you can somehow interact with uh, the component at each stage. And the render method is actually one of the lifecycle hooks, but uh, it is a required lifecycle hook. Uh, lifecycle hook. Um, so one thing to remember from this slide is that we have a three stages that each class component has, and a render method, which is one of the lifecycle hooks, and it a required one. A more in depth into the mounting, updating, and unmounting. So. Again, mounting is the component is ready to mount in the browser. So it's done, the, the React library done its job. It, it created objects inside the memory of JavaScript and it's ready to mount, which is actually add uh, that compile JSX into the actual DOM itself in the browser. Then there is an updating stage that the component um, updates in two ways, sending new props and updating the state. Mm, uh, to paraphrase this whole thing is, update happens to a mounted component in two cases. One, updated props, so the parent passed new props to a child, and some state changed. So the component itself interacted with its state and it changed the state and then the component uh, unmounting itself um, after being ripped from the DOM and wiped from the memory it can still do some things some cleaning up for example um, I will later show you that the, we can do some analytics stuff in there or even better we can uh, cancel promises uh, or requests I should say not just promises uh, and during those stages, mounting and updating and unmounting, we have different stages that we can interact with. Think of the whole life cycle method or hooks thing in React as the real life that you have your young age till the end of teen age. And then you have an uh, adult uh, life. And then the unmounting is your elderly life. And then 
uh, by different uh, life cycle methods in each of the stages, in each of the phases, you can have a peak with a constructor into the school, then with a component it mounted to the graduation from the school, then updating is like uh, getting a job, losing a job, and then uh, finally f uh, maybe getting fired or quitting the job and again and again and again. It happens lots of times. And then unmounting is eventually uh, like passing away. So uh, that brings us to a whole set of life cycle method that exists in each phases. Uh, the list is not exhaustive, as I remember, and you don't really need to know all the methods just to be aware of them. It's, it's good enough. But some of the methods are fundamental to the whole React thing and which are highlighted or bold in the slide. A more uh, in-depth uh, diagram of the same lifecycle method showing you the different ways the data flows uh, through the components already. And then we're, we're, in, we're now going into the uh, mounting stage, mounting phase, and mounting starts with construct the method. So as you can see on this slide, the mounting state at the top it starts with a constructor. Every time a component renders, it starts by executing a constructor, just like a typical class does. So it calls a constructor to construct the uh, instance uh, of a component or a class. So it serves two purposes. We initialize some local state, uh, so as I mentioned, we can uh, add this dot state equals and a new object. And we bind event handlers. Uh, event handlers that are defined inside a class needs to be bind uh, to the instance of the component. However, um, after some um, passage of some TS39 uh, update to JavaScript, um, I don't remember which one. I, I think it's called component uh, class properties. This update to the core JavaScript language in, introduced a way to avoid calling constructor all the time and literally writing your state equals object and methods as arrow functions inside your class component, getting rid of those initialization steps. And uh, this is what a best practice in React currently is. Um, we don't use constructor most of the time. React library does it for us using core JavaScript tools. We just define state as object and methods as arrow functions, and that's it. Uh, how, in the con how are you can use you can still use the constructor and. Uh, Basically, constructor is not a really good place to have uh, data fetching um, or maybe some DOM manipulation. There are better places for that, and there are some like good reasons for not using some side effects uh, in the constructor. Um, as it mentioned, <coughs> as it's mentioned in the uh, in the bottom of the slide, uh, a better place for a side effect is component is mount hook and we'll dive deeper why uh, it's a better place in the next uh, couple of slides. So render uh, also a, a lifecycle method that exists not only in the mounting stage but also in the updating stage. Uh, the main purpose of render is to return some React elements, array, fragments, strings, basically things that need to be rendered to, to the screen. Um, and yeah, it has some um, it is like it will not be invoked if should component update returns. So in the whole um, diagram, if this should component update returns false, as you can see, there is a little cross. It means that we're not going to the render, we're not like uh, showing anything to the user, we just uh, evaluate to uh, null, so there's nothing 
in the actual DOM. Uh, and then finally, in the mounting stage at the end, we have component did mount. This is a perfect place for us to make AJAX call, DOM manipulation, state updates, anything that uh, revolve, uh, revolves around uh, side effects. Why? Because we're already finished with the rendering. Uh, as you can see on the diagram, the render step has already passed. It's also uh, uh, called uh, on the left a render phase. This is the phase where exactly we are evaluating the virtual DOM and we're constructing the whole tree and then the pre-commit phase, which is the uh, the phase where we read the DOM, the actual current DOM, compare it and then commit the changes. And component did mount is uh, a hook, the lifecycle hook that has access to anything it might ever need uh, in terms of DOM, AJAX. It doesn't block anything. It It's a good place for us to have uh, side effects. Just remember that. And as you might guess, in, in the updating phase, component did update, it's the same place, same reason. We already passed the whole rendering, committing uh, phases. So we are not uh, busy with the, uh, a very um, complex stuff anymore. And updating stage basically is all about should component update. So when the component updates, has props or states changed and it needs to decide whether it needs to be updated or not. And should component update is actually the thing that uh, defines the pew component, uh, the difference between pew component and a function uh, and a component itself. Uh, remember from the previous lecture, we have a way for us to define class component based on uh, just react.component and something called react.pure component. And under the hood, they are different in the way that the should component update is defined and works um, by the way that the Facebook team, team has given us. However, we can still have access to should component update. And it's the way for us to decide whether we need to update or not. And uh, as the semantic goes, should component update, should return false if the component does not need to be updated and it stays in the tree when it does not do any uh, re-render. And yes, or true, I should say, if uh, the update is needed. And pure components uh, class that Facebook team given us is a should component update uh, life cycle, uh, basically contains should component update lifecycle hook that uh, has already mm, has predefined logic with a shallow compare props. So in a nutshell, pure component is the component that in should component update checks shallow, shallowly checks if props change or not. This is the whole thing. And then when we actually update it, um, or when we actually is about to um, update, we can get a snapshot of the update to actually have a fail-saved thing. Uh, for example, as the slide mentions, we can examine the score position so, uh, and after update, we can actually uh, deduce the the amount uh, that the scroll happened. Very limited use cases. I need to mention that because it's on the uh, official slide uh, of the lifecycle method uh, schema. But uh, a more uh, oopsie. Uh, let me go back. A more prominent a lifecycle hook in the update phase is, as I mentioned, component did update. Basically, same thing as component did mount, but it happens after the update phase. So, for example, if in the class component you need to have two consequent uh, um, fetch, 
uh, requests that um, one depends on the previous one, you can have one in the component did mount and then the other one in the component did update. And they happen consequently. And then in the mounting stage, as I mentioned already, uh, we can have some outgoing network requests, uh, um, cancellation, remove all event listeners. Uh, it's not really uh, a common thing to do because React is quite optimized in the way, but it still exists. We can do some magic in there also. Uh, so all the mentioned lifecycle hooks are like a de facto standard for a React developer to know about and to, at some stages in their adult React developer life, uh, to actually use them. Um, and, but the thing is, uh, there are some unsafe, so-called unsafe lifecycle methods because they are legacy. Um, they were given at the beginning of the React uh, ecosystem. Um, birth but the thing is that the use cases are so limited and the benefit that one gets uh, while using those lifecycle methods is so shallow that developers decided to actually get rid of them and um, under the hood to avoid uh, to improve backward compatibility they just kept them but marked unsafe so do not use them in production, do not use them in the development, just know about them. Um, and yeah, that's it. But while we have a way for us to um, have an intrusion into the life of uh, a component, uh, we only have this opportunity with class components. What about functional components? Um, and a few years ago, uh, React developers giving the whole thing about classes being too much code to maintain and to write uh, your projects in. They introduced hooks as the way to do almost the same magic that we can do in class components, but in functional components. So we don't extend anything from anywhere. We just have our basic function that returns JSX. It's done as hell. But still, with hooks, it can do really cool things. Uh, it can go to um, a backend, request some data, uh, use states actually. So they made functional components really, really useful, uh, not uh, fine grain tuned as class components, but still quite usable, uh, usable and thus giving us a lot of uh, default functionality and most important even with the basic hooks uh, and the react and the additional hooks that the react team gave us we can still write our own hooks so basically um, the way for us to do so is we take any a combination of those hooks combine them into the function store the function somewhere then import to our functional component and call it. So uh, with class components, we had a really good um, span of lifecycle methods. In functional components, we didn't. Now, in functional components, we have a way for us to simulate almost any lifecycle hook that class components have, but also to define a really, really cool uh, our own lifecycle hooks. And this is all based on the functional components and pure functions. And it gained some um, traction. It gained some traction over the two years, I think, that they've been introduced. Um, however, in production, as far as I recall, in official production, it's still not widely used, so the best thing to do is to know about them, maybe try some code coding with them, but in production it's still a far away from actually a fail-safe thing to use. So React as a um, 
the view line breed has some uh, great things that they uh, gave us, uh, and those things are uh, we don't interact directly with them. Basically, we using a React library, we just declare a DOM-like thing called JSX. We give that JSX to React, and we expect React to render it somewhere we say. Um, however, even uh, with this declarative approach, uh, they couldn't just leave us without the imperative approach, imperative way for writing logic, uh, the algorithms, and the DOM manipulation also. So they introduced a ref into into React, and it basically acts uh, the same as uh, get element by ID. We just uh, expect that any React element has a ref, has a way for us to uh, get uh, the reference, like we get the reference to an element using get element by ID at any point in the life in the whole phases of uh, uh, React development, uh, React uh, lifecycle of the component, and then do anything with it. A typical thing is to use it for focus. As we are writing uh, JSX, we don't have actually a wait rule just to imperatively say, when we click that button, please focus uh, somewhere, because we just, we've already given a React, uh, all it needs to know to render and take that responsibility from us. Uh, but with the ref, we still save a reference to that element for us to later use it to focus it, for example, or to uh, write animation logic, for example. So a really thing, a must uh, know thing in React development. Um, in short, ref is a way for us to get a reference to a React element for us to later use. Fragments, also a very cool thing. Uh, at some point uh, in our web development life, uh, front-end community, we might have seen that hell of a div inception, I should say. And React is no different. At some point, you will see in uh, in the tree that all you need to do is to actually render a list of different components uh, into a container. But you cannot return lists because uh, React just does not allow that to happen. A function needs, uh, as we know, that the functions are the functions and objects are. Uh, a, at core of React library, and a function or object needs to be uh, a one thing. It cannot just like span a whole lot of objects uh, in return for our actions. So uh, almost the same logic goes deep inside React, and they say you cannot return a list of objects from a component. It always needs to be wrapped with a single div single block, single element. And uh, it's not really like convenient for us. Um, lots of use cases when we don't need that. And fragments that later, at a late stage was were introduced in uh, React library has given us the ability to do so. So <sighs> fragments are basically things that are not rendered. They give us the ability to work with React, but they're not actually rendered. What do I mean by that? If I basically have a um, uh, the innermost div, yet another 16 wrapper, I can just uh, exclude all the wrappers, all the divs that are wrapped around the some heading and some text by providing a fragment. So instead of uh, having div with some class inside our JSX wrapping around H1 and P, we will have an empty tag, a fragment, or uh, react.fragment tag. That will 
serve its purpose and just disappear. This is what's called fragment. It's a cool, really cool thing to look into. Error boundaries. At some point in your React developer life, you will get into a stage when you're trying to render something and then it just goes red. Uh, and uh, there are lots of reasons for that. You might have just uh, saved the wrong data uh, in your component or <laughs> the wrong code or some uh, parent passed a or wrong props child and uh, it's just messy to avoid that thing and and actually to provide a default behavior in that situation react development team introduced the error boundary what is an error boundary a special type of component and given us uh, by react that we wrap around uh, a set of components that we expect to have errors inside that will give us this red screen. And then error boundary, if the error happens, just handles the rest. So basically, you just wrap error boundary around your component that's expected to have errors inside, and it just doesn't throw any errors. It notifies you, it gives you some uh, warning, it gives you a default state, default user feedback, so a view will be a default view, and that's it. It has some uh, lifecycle hooks, uh, which are component did catch and get derived state from errors. Almost the same thing, basically, it gives us ability to catch those errors as we need to um, work with them, so handle the errors. And we handle the errors in React by rendering a default thing. Um, but as with try catch, that <laughs> gives us default thing and uh, a flow control whether to render something or not. Uh, error boundaries are also limited in their use cases, and basically they don't, they, they don't work with asynchronous code. So asynchronous code could be event handlers, uh, things that happen later in life and cannot be statically caught asynchronous code same thing uh, server-side rendering yes because we are um, doing like we're creating a string so there's nothing to render yet with server-side rendering uh, and of course error boundaries cannot <laughs> catch errors that are uh, originated from inside error boundaries. In, <laughs> otherwise, it would be like an uh, inception thing. And that's how it looks. It's just a uh, class component uh, for, that extends from react.component. It has some uh, defined uh, uh, lifecycle hooks and some our custom logic uh, that logs an error, for example, in component did catch. It wraps around uh, a component inside the render. As you can see, if state dot has error, so error happened and we somehow did manage to log it and save the error in the state, we return not just an error from the children, but something went wrong. And if there's no error, we just return the children and actually user will know <laughs> will have no idea that the error boundaries exists there because error boundary again does not render anything until there is an error and the whole thing with wrapping around uh, uh, components and somehow tweaking or changing their behavior is uh, the whole topic from functional programming it's called high order functions um, yeah that's it. Harder components are the same thing as harder functions, essentially. And uh, uh, their purpose to exist is actually to accept functions and return functions, but with some kind of altered behavior. So a classic example is uh, error boundary. In some way, it's a rougher, high-order component that extends uh, a component children components to have an error defaulting behavior 
same thing with higher order components. Later, uh, when you have an ability, uh, um, when when you have an opportunity, ah, fuck, sorry, when you have an opportunity to um, um, to look into Redux uh, state management library, you will have uh, an opportunity to see a connect uh, harder function that gets uh, some kind of configuration um, from the state. It wraps around how the components and um, and then uh, it just does connect a component to a Redux store. This is uh, a very useful behavior. It goes really good with uh, the whole React paradigm of composition versus inheritance. So you're composing functions, you are using a React hooks, for example, and you're using higher components, and then you're basically writing a really robust and error-free uh, functional code, um, giving the whole paradigm around React. And it's actually a direction that React Library is uh, moving into, which is more functional components, more functional uh, behaviors from functional paradigm. So expect to see um, a more trendy thing with uh, React hooks, um, writing React components only using functional components, using uh, React hooks inside of them, writing your own hooks, also uh, having this composition uh, thing everywhere in the code base, uh, wrapping around things, extending functionality of your components, not just reusing them somewhere uh, out of the project, but also reusing the whole set of logic inside of your React uh, code base. And that concludes our React Advanced lecture. I hope you have questions for me. Uh, otherwise, you will have an opportunity to review the lecture. I think it might be a very good idea to review the lecture after we're done. Uh, and I see so far pretty descriptive. Okay. Interviewers ask me about hooks of every interview that I've been that had React and jobs bags. Uh, that's because it's a very trendy thing to know. Uh, and it, it just uh, the thing. Uh, just imagine a few years ago, React hooks uh, got introduced into the library, and then uh, a new developer came into JS World, start learning web development. It found out about React, and ta-da, there's a new thing. It starts. Uh, the developer actually started his journey from the React hooks. It knows just that, and class components are outside of their awareness. So some of the like, companies, they prefer either to be always ahead of time, trying to use React hooks in production, or they're just finding the developers with a novice React knowledge with React hooks much more easy. Okay, how to practice life cycles by writing a code and a link. Actually, a very <clears throat> good link uh, will be documentation. Uh, it's not just a joke, uh, guys. React documentation is quite awesome. Uh, I mean, like, only Vue.js documentation could compete with such a masterpiece, I think. Um, so, what I usually do is that. Uh, if I need to practice some code, uh, I think I'm going to go to the documentation advanced guides and then somewhere in, um, like along the line of AP reference might be. Uh, let me just Google component mount. Uh, and then they will give you some uh, code snippets um, once you go through the whole thing. Um, and then, while reading in depth uh, the use cases of those lifecycle hooks, 
you might introduce those use cases inside your project. So mm, from top of the head, you can go and react, uh, write a React uh, lifecycle hook for fetching data, uh, fetching then fetching data using a previously fetched data uh, to fetch additional data. For example, you, ju you fetch a user profile and then you use some kind of piece of information from the user profile to fetch uh, a user preferences, for example. Uh, this will utilize component did mount and component did update. Uh, then you might be um, tempted to use React as a way to write uh, animations. This will introduce you to the whole refs thing, references, and uh, it you, that, that will get you thinking where you need to put logic of uh, um, setting um, uh, configuration of uh, display frames. So how to actually get the, the frames per second in the React library in sync with the browser. So that's also a way to go. Additionally, you, you might be tempted to use um, component update to uh, to know precisely when to render and when not to render so that's a very good place to look into so don't just write components using pure components but try to use a regular class components and writing should component update itself a very good strategy okay then we have hooks are very simple to extension so react that gives more features. Mm. Basically, um, what I mentioned uh, in class components is that lifecycle hooks are functions that are, giving our, are given us by Facebook team, and we cannot extend them. We cannot uh, change the number of hooks and their placement inside the code uh, with. React hooks, however, you can have a basic and advanced set of hooks that the Facebook team given you, and you can combine them any way you like to create new hooks and use them directly. Just store them in your code base, import uh, the, the already written hook in one, from one component to another one, and reuse it. So not only are you reusing a like, view logic, with components, it's been with React for the longest time, but also you, you're reusing some business logic. That's the main use case. Okay, um, so what approach is right now more on the production line for React OP, a more functional approach with hooks? You know, uh, in React world, there is this saying of uh, composition versus inheritance. If you go to main com concepts and you actually go through at least main concepts, you will eventually hit the 11th link, which is composition versus inheritance. Inheritance, and it's stated that inheritance is not really used in React. The only time you inherit something in React is that. Uh, where is it? Yes, a class test uh, extends component. So that's the only inheritance that you are doing. And this is the only thing you need to do, actually. Uh, why do you need inheritance to React? Because you want access to those predefined functions that Facebook team given you. That's the only thing. Uh, a bad practice would be if I uh, e export this text class then import it somewhere uh, else in the code base, and then extend from the test uh, class. This is not a really good thing to do. Um, you'll find uh, the most code in production. It's not legacy code, um, but you will find most code written using stateless plus stateful components, with stateful components being a place where you extend once from a default React component, and then do your logic. And every time you need a container, a new container, you just extend it right from the React component, not from the other containers. 
So, and then you compose everything else. So, my um, my take on the this question would be, uh, it's neither OP nor functional approach. It's more about um, extending from a default React component and then using the stateless stateful approach. However, it might be the case that new and small companies might use React hooks right away. In my experience, I've never been in the project that is written entirely with uh, hooks. I've been to projects that are written mostly in functional components. However, they had uh, a, at the very top, they had a some kind of class component and then some kind of messaging system, for example, RxJS, that gets those uh, uh, lifecycle methods and streamlines it to anything that needs to have access. So it's still the same combination of class component and functional components. So I hope I answered that. Um, we got in schedule all lectures marked as React node sales. It all will there be topic middleway taken? Maybe React sagas. A so I can I can say for sure that the next lecture will be uh, regarding a set of next lectures will be regarding styling of your React components. There are a couple of ways you can style your components, and it's not just CSS. Trust me, it's some weird stuff too. <laughs> Um, then you'll have React Router, which is a way for us to actually utilize React as it's supposed to be utilized with the, uh, in the area of SPA, single page application. So React Router will be covered independently. Then we have a two, I think, lectures with, uh, with a focus on Redux basics and Redux advanced features and in advance I think we'll have uh, React Tank, React Sagas and some other asynchronous uh, Redux Tank, Redux Sagas and Redux Async. So yes. Okay. So guys, um, what do you think? Do you have any other questions or you're just overwhelmed with the amount of information and you need some time to rest in this wonderful evening? Okay. You're welcome. Yes, it's everything you need to know about React at, at this point. So, um, thanks for your attention. Um, sorry if it was uh, a bit rough on the edges. Uh, uh, it's a very late evening and it's quite hot. So, uh, a brain doesn't work exactly as it's supposed to be in such conditions. So sorry about that. We'll have a um, this lecture recorded and uh, see you next time. Thanks.